Amen. Welcome, church. Goodness, y'all are a lively bunch this morning. A lot of, lot of chatter going on, you know, and we're just excited to be back. We're excited about what God's doing in this season of the year. You know, the Jews see this as the month of Nisan, and, and that's the beginning of things, the new era. It's interesting what's happening. If y'all are paying attention at all, you'll find out that last night began the Passover as the Jewish custom, and this coming Sunday... They uh, continue with Passover up until Sunday, and it's the celebration, the uh, culmination of Passover, if you will. So Christians and Jews are celebrating both alike right now. It's interesting how the calendars, the Christian, the Jewish calendar aligned this year and uh, what God is going to do from that. And I pray that we can truly see, look, if, if you're uh, uh, Jewish, don't miss this. Don't let me say it this way. If we get it wrong about Christ, it doesn't matter what else we get right. It doesn't. There is a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, no longer to cover up sins, but that the sins might be taken away, that we might receive the power within in order for our sins to be taken away, removed completely. It's the truth of God. Last night was the biblical Passover. It's the 15th day of Nisan. Jesus observed the Passover. I want you to know, Jesus himself said, I came first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. A lot of things are starting to purge out of this. Now, last night, it would have been the time that we, we would have seen Jesus going through the agony and all of the despair in the Garden of Gethsemane through his trials, his, his, his ability to, to kneel down in the Garden of Gethsemane and say, Father, if it be thy will, remove this cup from me, but yet not my will, but thine be done. He reminds us that we too have a cross that we have to bear to take up our cross daily and follow him. That there's, there's something that happens to fullness of measure with God at this time. This morning, it's interesting, this morning, if you're following along in the Christian calendar, this and, and, and even the Jewish calendar for that matter, this is the day that, that basically the crucifixion or the high priest would actually enter in. And at the third hour, he would put the sacrifice upon the altar, but he wouldn't sacrifice it at that time. And yet on the sixth hour, this is interesting, he would shed the blood of that unblemished lamb which if you know anything about today and the crucifixion of Jesus, that at the third hour, Jesus was hung on the cross. And on the sixth hour, what happened? He gave up. He said, Father, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. Look, this isn't by accident what's happening. This is foreordained by God. But we must get it right about Christ. We must see what God is attempting and has attempted to do from generation to generation to generation. For centuries, God has wanted none to perish. And so he's provided a way. The first week we talked about how God creates for his glory because he's holy, he's good, he's merciful. The second week we talk about what God forms, he feels, he pours into, he gives life. He, he formed the earth and he filled it. He forms us and he fills us. In the third week, we talked about the importance of understanding our identity, who we are in Christ Jesus, and that God, before we were even knit in our mother's womb, he formed us. He has a plan. He has a purpose for us. The fourth week, we talked about this separation. Look, I mentioned this last week. I don't know why it had to be a blood sacrifice, but God made the rules. I didn't. And so there had to be something given. Blood had to be shed from Old Testament to New Testament in order for people to be atoned for because sin entered the world and it created this gap. 1 Corinthians 1.22, the apostle, or yeah, I think that's what I said. You know, I noticed yesterday I was having a hard time with my eyes. For the first time, I was like, man, I'm having a hard time reading this. What? What? So I had to expand my font. <laughs> Praise God, as this body is perishing, hopefully my soul is becoming more and more restored, right, and redeemed every day. Bless God. But I don't want to preach in glasses. Please help me, Jesus. 
1 Corinthians 1.22, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. When, when, when Paul boiled out his preaching, when everything else boiled out, he said, this is where I land. I preach Christ and I preach him crucified. Because at that cross, something happened. We went from the Passover to the crossover. And it's so important that we gain this. And not only do we just have the knowledge, but we have the wisdom to apply what we know. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Blood makes atonement. The, the high priest in the day of atonement, I shared this last week, that he would go into the Holy of Holies. Of course, they would tie a rope around his foot. He would be kept up for over 24 hours. He had to wear certain garments. He had to be washed in certain places, in certain areas. He had to be seen as fully clean, and he would enter into that Holy of Holies. And if there was any type of blemish upon him, it could be detrimental for his life. And he could fall over. He could die right there in the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. And they would have to drag him out because no one else was worthy of entering the Holy of Holies. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, we find out that the veil of the temple was torn in two. And through Christ, he has made a way for us to come into the very presence of God. Well, we can get excited about this. See, the Passover had to become the crossover. If we get anything else wrong, it's, it's dangerous. If we don't get Christ right, it is dangerous for us, for the next generation, and for the generations to come. There had to be a sacrifice given to bridge the gap. Have you ever thought when Jesus hung on the cross, all the statements that he made? Let me read you the seven statements that Jesus made. And one of these statements really pierces my heart. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So as Jesus hung on the cross, he understood, look, I have just gone through this, this palm day where they laid all these palm branches in front of me and I was able to ride a colt and people said, blessed Hosanna is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he, King of the Jews. And as they celebrated him, as he rode in Jerusalem, just prior to that, the scripture says he wept over Jerusalem because he knew that those who would praise him would cry crucified just a hand full of days later. Father, forgive them. Well, it makes sense that Jesus, because he's a sacrificial lamb offered on our behalf, that Jesus would say, Father, forgive them. He said, today, speaking of the thief on the cross, you will be with me in paradise. The third thing he says, John, this is your mother. In other words, look, she was my mother here upon this earth, but she is going to need to be taken care of. She's going to need to be cared for. So John, this is your mother. He said, I'm thirsty. The fifth thing he said, he said, it is finished. It is finished. I love that because that Greek word there is to telestat, which means it cannot be added to, it cannot be taken away from. This is a completion. This is a total work. It is done and said forth from, from this time forth. In other words, no longer will there have to be a day of atonement because this is the day that it happens for all eternity. We won't have to come back to this year after year after year and cover with the blood of Jesus or cover with the blood of the Lamb. Now Jesus' blood is a once and for all sacrifice. You can't add to this. You can't take it away. To Tetelestai, it is finished. It is complete. And the sixth thing he says is, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Which, like I said, it's interesting to me because that happened on the sixth hour. In the sixth hour when the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, that's when he would slay the, blood, the lamb. But this one I, I'm challenged with. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You ever felt forsaken by God? You ever wondered why God is so distant? You ever wondered why God uh, just doesn't seem to hear your prayers? Have you ever wondered, God, why did you place me on this earth in the first place? God, how can I wreck this any more than I've already wrecked it? God, why is there so much distance between you and I? God, are you forsaking me? 
It was something that had to be said because it's actually quoting David in Psalm 22. The David and Jesus, you have to remember that his throne is built upon the Davidic throne, an eternal throne that started with David's throne. We talked about this in Bravehearts for eight weeks. You got to get this. So he's quoting, he's saying, here I come. Father, where are you? In other words, something is happening here. Now, when I say this, we have to remember the Trinity. And for us in our humanity and our human brains, it's hard for us to understand this. But watch, in our own humanity, we probably ask the question, Lord, are you even there? And God's going to show up in a powerful, powerful way. You see, Jesus was not just about to experience a physical death as a consequence to sin. He was about to take away the penalty of sin. Now, church, let me tell you the difference on this, because we kind of need to understand something here, that there are consequences of sin. When you sin today, guess what? There's probably going to be a consequence somewhere. It's not God up there going, I'm going to whack him. I've got her. I've got, oh, she's, she's going to do it. Whack. I used to grow up with a kind of a concept of God in that way. Some of you did too. All right, I had a friend of mine that grew up in Catholic schools, and he was telling me that the nuns used to go around with a ruler. And if you weren't writing or doing your work, just whack right across your hand. And sometimes that's our concept of God. But I want you to know there are consequences to sin that we ourselves will experience in this life. But the penalty of sin, if you are found in Christ Jesus, is no longer there. Jesus received the penalty as well, a separation from the flesh and the spirit. Of God. I don't know how to necessarily explain this other than let's say you love your wife and you're willing to die for her. I don't know why I wrote it that way. Maybe I should have said, let's say you love your wife and you're willing to live for her. That's even better, right? But let's just say, but you can't be an exchange for her because you yourself, man, I know you because I am one. You have sin in your life. So you can't exchange your life for her life. Purity had to be exchanged for impurity. And now Jesus, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, he has no sin, never sinned, so he is an appropriate exchange for the sins of the world to take away the penalty. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it this way, for he who knew no sin, he never had sin, right? He had to become sin so we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That word righteousness means it is as it should be between myself and God. Not because of what I've done, not a righteousness of my own, but a righteousness of what God has done through Him, Himself. And as I believe in that, I'm in His righteousness. And so the penalty for sin and eternal separation from God is no longer there for me or you that would put your faith in Him. So when Jesus dies, He's experiencing both the consequence of sin and the penalty of sin, even if it's just for a short time, which is a separation from God. Now, like I said, our mind can't really wrap around this. I know there are a lot of theologians that would probably disagree with me for even preaching this in a message outside of a teaching. But I want us to get a concept of what's really taking place here. This is why John the Baptist, when he, when he is baptizing in a baptism of repentance, that, that word metanoia, repentance, that Greek word means to change one's mind. In doing so, it will change your behavior. In other words, you're going to have to change your mind because no longer is it going to be a high priest that enters the Holy of Holies that it's going to make atonement for your sins. But one is coming whom sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. I'm not even worthy. And yet that one approaches on the other side of the river. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, no longer covers them up. A perfect, a perfect Lamb that is going to shed His blood and take away the penalty of sin. So here we are, Palm Sunday. Mark chapter 14, Matthew 21, Luke 19, Mark 11. Go read one. You know what I do during Holy Week is I just read the Gospels. I just read them. It's been a tradition of mine for years, just Get in there and just read the Gospels. If you don't have time or feel like you don't have time for that, read, read the passion stories throughout all the Gospels because that's where you gain all this. 
Now, in Mark 11, we see it's when Jesus and the disciples uh, approach Jerusalem, and he sends a couple of disciples ahead of him and tells them to enter the city gates, and you will find a colt tied there that no one has ever sat upon. People will ask you what you are doing. Tell them it's for your master. Now, this is interesting to me because where is Jesus going at this time? What are they setting up for? They're setting up for Passover because Jesus is a Jew. And so he's about to take them in this upper room. He's about to sit down with his disciples and he's about to make not just a proclamation, but he's about to make a declaration. It's huge. You see, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He was taking them from the Passover to the crossover. The Passover celebrated the last of the plagues, but it was the worst plague as well. It was the worst plague that came upon them. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 21, here's what they were celebrating. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and take for yourselves lambs according to your family and slay the Passover lamb and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood, which is the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lentil and the two doorposts and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until the morning. Now, this is interesting because the lentil and the doorpost, the doorpost, of course, it forms a cross, both doorpost and then the lentil, the top of the door. And because that blood would be there, that, that angel of death would not enter upon their house where the blood had been placed. And so they were safe behind the blood. You can even say it this way, they were safe within the blood. And so it's interesting to me that this is what Jesus is going to to celebrate. He sends his disciples forward. He said, hey, you guys go and set this thing up, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to celebrate this Passover with you. As a matter of fact, he says, when he sits down with them, he said, I have eagerly desire to eat this meal with you before I suffer. Because you celebrate the Passover of a lamb. Our generations have been told to celebrate this. Now I'm going to show you that I am the Lamb who has come to take away the sin of the world. And so in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Uh Uh-oh, no longer am I talking about this Lamb. I'm talking about me. This is my body, which is given for you. In the same way, he took the cup, and after that he had eaten, he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jeremiah, who I hope I get this right. (laughs) Jeremiah was the first one to prophesy about this new covenant. It's Jeremiah 31, 31. He prophesied that one day there's going to be a new covenant. There's going to be bloodshed. There's going to be something take place. There's going to be a shift, if you will. As a matter of fact, all of Jerusalem at this time was buzzing. The Passover was about to happen. The Jews would come in to celebrate the Passover. And so it was a buzz. It was kind of a circus-like atmosphere anyway. And here you got Jesus, Palm Sunday, riding into Jerusalem And there's this buzz. There's just something that's about to break through. There's something about to intersect the world on behalf of humanity. And it's going to be powerful and it's going to be big and it's going to be huge and it's going to just shake everything up. And it's going to happen through this blood that is poured out for you in the new covenant. See, that's the power within we tend to think, man, I want to be a powerful man of God. I want to be a powerful woman of God. But the power within is actually only found in God himself, in Christ Jesus. This is why the apostle Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who does what? Lives in me. That's where the power comes from. By the way, the apostle Paul was pretty powerful because his very shadow, his very handkerchief could heal someone. But he found himself in Christ, and that's where the power within is. So today I want us to look at a few things and talk about this blood and talk about where we are today because the truth is on the Christian calendar along with the Jewish calendar today something magnificent happened and it would be the shedding of this blood. If you have your Bibles, uh, you guys in the back just try to stay with me. Who knows where I'm going now? I only wrote half the message. Said, Lord, you got to give me the other. I'm just kidding. 
Luke chapter 22. So in Luke chapter 2, verse 13, you'll see, and they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. I've already explained that to you. And you drop down, and he, he gives uh, the Lord's Supper, as we like to call it today, the Eucharist, an offering, if you will. And then as we go on down, you'll see that Jesus finds himself on the Mount of Olives. And this is verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching that place, he said to them, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. There'll be a lot of distractions. A lot of things are going to try to occupy your mind during this day and time. There's a circus going on in Jerusalem. There's a lot of things that are happening. You guys have followed me for three years, but I want to tell you something. Pray that you don't hear all the other voices, all the other persuasions that are out there in the culture. You follow me. Listen to me. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now, this is an interesting thing that right, right here, he's kind of laying a foundation of what happens at the cross when he says, uh, uh, Lord, Lord, why have you forsaken me? Or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right here you see his humanity as well. You see a little bit of a separation, but I believe the Lord shows us that to show the humanity side of Jesus. Now his humanity side is very different from us. Just let me say that because in our humanity we sin. Don't look at me like you don't. We do. But look, here's the perfect Lamb of God, never sinned. He's in the garden. He's knelt down. He says, Father, if it be thy will, Remove, this is a tough cup. This is a cup that's talked about in Mark chapter 10 when the, when the uh, disciples are trying to listen to Jesus. As a matter of fact, the scripture says he called them over and he said, hey, listen up, I'm, I'm about to, these things are about to happen. They're going to spit on me. They're going to pull my beard out. They're going to crucify me. But on the third day, I'm raised from the dead. And this is when a couple of disciples said, hey, how about this, Jesus? Can one of us sit on your right and the other one sit on your left in the kingdom? See, it's all about, uh, where I want to say is all about position. That's why Jesus kind of had to flip that one. Hit. Wait, are y'all willing to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? So right here, it's not a good cup because Jesus said, if there's any other way, please. But obedience and sacrifice in this time with Jesus went together. Now watch how this plays out. Verse 43, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. We can read this and skip that quickly, but I want you to see something about this angel. This is the angel that comes along and props Jesus up. Jesus had to endure what no man could ever endure. He was about to endure what none of us could ever be asked to endure because our bodies would shut down, but Jesus had to be propped up if you will. So an angel appears there. He's strengthening him and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So uh, you may have heard me every year I try to teach on this. That term in the medical field is known as hemitidrosis. And basically, if you've ever been embarrassed or ashamed or, uh, uh uh-oh, my stopwatch just shut off. We're in trouble. (laughs) Hemitidrosis. What happens is it's similar to being embarrassed or ashamed where you've seen it happen when someone turns uh, red and basically what happens, the capillaries fill up with blood very quickly. Well, in this type of anguish, your sweat glands are, are sweating profusely. You're losing water quickly. And, and your sweat glands, actually these, these capillaries just below the skin, they fill at such a rapid pace that they actually burst just below the skin. And so the sweat glands actually force the blood to the outside of the skin. We don't see this often today. And the reason why is because we don't live in this type of anguish. It's not foreign to every nation where Christians are persecuted, where Christians are losing their life. But normally when this happens, you have about two to five minutes at the most because your body loses uh, water at such a fast rate that normally you would pass out. But an angel appeared strengthening him. By the way, somebody who's gone through hemitidrosis, their skin becomes paper thin. You can thump it and it breaks. This is how Jesus started as the Passover lamb. This is just the beginning. 
And he's already got skin now that is thin. He's got skin that is brittle. He's got skin that will break. Because it's going to require this, this type of sacrifice is going to require every ounce of blood. Now, I would like to keep going through Luke's account, but I'm going to have a switch quickly, if you will, over to Mark so that we can move a little bit quicker through the crucifixion. That almost sounds sacrilegious for me to say that, honestly. We should never move quickly through the crucifixion, but I want us to see something. In Mark's gospel, we pick up in Mark chapter 15. And I'm just going to start there with verse 15. And wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Now, just prior to this, I just want you to know, Jesus goes before Pilate twice. The second time, he is convicted, tried, and crucified on the same day. Now, the only reason I bring that up is for this. Some would say that Jesus received 39 lashings upon this scourging. And the reason is, is because of Mosaic law. Mosaic law said that you could not uh, whip someone or scourge them over, thir- over 40 times. If you went over 40, then the Roman who did that or whoever was giving out that type of punishment, they too would have to be scourged 40 times. So it was normal to stop at 39 just in case they miscounted, right? Pretty smart. But I want you to hear something. I don't know how many times Jesus was scourged. Because according to Mosaic law, you could not be convicted, tried, and crucified on the same day. So they weren't following Mosaic law anyway. I mean, the crowd cried out when they offered them Barabbas or they offered them Jesus. The crowd cried out, Jesus, put him, crucify him. And so here they started and he scourged 39 times at the least, at the least. The whip itself would be 8 to 10 feet long. It would normally have the talus bone of a sheep tied on the end of it. Sometimes they would roll it in glass. Other times they would have actually steel ball bearings at the end of that. But we feel like, and and the research that I've done, it was probably the talus bone of a sheep that was easy to get a hold of so that every time that whip went across his back, it would lay him open. Now remember, his skin is very brittle. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace or the praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. Now, let me just talk about that for just a moment. So here these soldiers bring him out and they place a purple robe on him. That's just like a Band-Aid. You know what blood does when it soaks into your into your shirt and all of a sudden you take your shirt off and you go, ow! Okay, well, they laid this on him. They, they put a purple robe across his back and the blood would be absorbed into the robe. And, and after that happened, they, they got a crown of thorns. The crown of thorns, the, the thorns were nor- normally an inch to three and a half inches long. And it really wasn't a crown of thorns at all. We see Jesus hanging on a cross with a little thin rail around his head. No, it would be a hat of thorns. They would actually weave these together. It looked like a paper plate and they would just press that down upon the head. And they began to call out to him, hell, king of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And then they mocked him. They took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him to crucify him. Let me uh, say a couple of things. In, in a couple of other of the accounts where this happens, they actually lead him out. They blindfold him and they, the soldiers begin to beat him. They begin to strike him and then they back away. They take the blindfold off and they say, tell us the one who hit you. This is how would they would test the prophets in their day and time. It wasn't unusual to, to test prophets in their day. And today, prophets make all kinds of money out there oftentimes. No one challenges their prophecy. Imagine, would you want to be a prophet? They're going to blindfold you and punch you and then 10 of them back away and somebody takes the blindfold off and say, now tell us which one hit you. Let's see just how much of a prophet you are. Let's see if you know 
right? And so they played this game with Jesus, with his skin being so brittle, so fragile, and they broke the skin upon his face. I wonder if he were even recognizable by the end of this. And then they took, they mocked him, they beat him, they spat upon him, then they took the purple robe off of him. And you can imagine what that looked like as they ripped that robe back off of his body and the blood continued to pour. You begin to understand when Jesus was sitting at that table and he said, this is my blood poured out for you and for you and for you and for you and for you. This is the price that has been paid. Then they took him out to crucify him. The Mount of Skull, you would say it's probably anywhere from about 150 to 300 yards in American terms, if you will, away. And so he was, he, they put the cross upon his back. You've probably seen the pictures. The, the part that went across his back is known as the patibulum. And that part would be very, very heavy. And they would strap that around the wrist and he would be called to carry that. And, and then he would begin to stumble. He would begin to fall. He was exhausted. He should have already passed out. He shouldn't have been, even been able to carry it three steps, much less as far as he did. But an angel appeared and was strengthening him, was picking him back up, saying, go on, keep moving on behalf of your people. And so he would carry this patibulum. And by the time he got to the place of crucifixion. He got to the top of the Mount of Skull. Uh, Skull. When they would lay him down there, they would then nail his wrist to the cross. Now, I know the Scripture says hands. Uh, the Jews consider the wrist a part of the hand. And so it's one of the reasons it's written the way it is. But you know if you had a nail in this hand, nail in this hand, especially if you're as heavy as I am, that's just, that nail's not going to hold. But if you put it between the radius and the ulna, if you go right between these two, yes, it will hold. And that's what they would nail. That's what they would pin. And right between those two bones lies a nerve. And that nerve is known as the median nerve. When I was uh, going through physical therapy uh, school in the Army, it's one of the things we had to know is all the muscles, the origins, the innervations, the insertions. And, and, and the interesting thing, the median nerve goes right between. Some of you have had carpal tunnel syndrome. Bless your heart. I'm not making fun of you. That's, that's a bad deal. It's the same nerve. And they would drive that nail between those nerves. Some people believe that may have been the most painful part of the crucifixion. And then they would prop him up and in the ground where the cross intersected the ground, that would already be up. That part was known as the stipus. It would look like a pencil end on the top. There would be a hole drilled in the patibulum and they would actually push it up and it would come over and catch. And there was the cross. And all of a sudden, things would change from the Passover to the crossover. Now a way is being made for all who would believe in Him. There would be a soldier who would come up, and it's interesting how this happens. In verse 35 of Mark 15, it was the third hour when they crucified Him, which was paralleling what the Jews would know. They knew what happened at the third hour. The written notice charged against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him. They hurled insults at him. But down in verse 33, at the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, il, Eloi, lama sabahatini, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling to Elijah. And then finally in verse 38, the curtain of the temple, or I'm sorry, in verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, meaning access has been gained for those who would believe in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. So, so good what God has done for us. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard this cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this is the Son of God. 
You know, for all of us this morning, we need to find ourselves at the foot of the cross. The foot of the cross. It's interesting that this centurion, probably the same one who walked up in another, in another account and, and pierced his side and water and blood poured out because that's where it pulled because there was no longer any blood left in him. It all poured out. And then he finds himself standing at the very feet of Jesus. He's standing at the foot of the cross. He turns and there's an earthquake and darkness covered the earth because the light had gone out. And he found himself at the feet of Jesus and he said, Surely, oh my goodness, that's him. And you hear Jesus' words, I not only came for the Jew, but for the Gentile. He even told one soldier, I've not met a man of such great faith. For God so loved the world that He filled the gap from the west side to the east side. From the top, from the heavens to the very bottoms of the earth. He intersected that all who would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you please stand? I'm going to ask the altar team to make their way forward this morning. You may be one out there that's saying those words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Maybe you're one of those who feels like you're too far away from God. But I'm telling you, it's not through our works, it's through the work that He did and that He's done. It's not through how good we are, but it's where our belief is and how good He is and how much He loved us. And so today on this Palm Sunday, I hope we don't just walk through it like the the Jews would on the Day of Atonement, that it just became a part of the tradition for sins to be covered up, but we truly understand the blood of Christ has taken away the sins of the world. Next week, we're going to find out how He empowers us to live a life that overcomes sin so that we too can be called overcomers through the power in His blood. We're here for you. We're here to pray with you. We're here to offer you Christ. We're here to encourage you, to equip you, to empower you to go and be the witness of who Christ is and who He was always meant to be, the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. give you an invitation to accept Him this morning in this prayer. Father God, If there's someone out there online and they've heard your message today, Lord, touch them right where they are. Let them know that an honest heart is a pure heart. And if today is the first time they put their faith in you and they are covered by your blood, that that Lord, they understand that from the east to the west, their sins are no more. Father, give them a church and reassure them a church to equip and empower them. Father, for those who are here that will make their way forward at the end of this service, Lord God, touch them, heal their hearts, and may they see the power in the blood of Jesus Christ, Your Son, who loved us so much that He gave Himself for us, poured Himself up to redeem a world that was lost in the gap. We love You, Jesus, and we thank You. It's in Your name we pray. Amen.